Good morning, love of Christ. Boy, what a beautiful morning it was. We sing about the beautiful name of Jesus and we talk about how beautiful it is outside. God has blessed us so richly. And so I'm Mark Tavis, the vacancy pastor here at Love of Christ. And I was um, listening to some conversations this morning Uh, out in the gathering area, and people are just getting excited about the future and what things are going to be happening. I heard some some talk about the call committee and different uh, different kinds of things going on with the different groups, and I just want to say, way to go. Way to go, love of Christ. Because what you're doing is you're saying Jesus makes a difference in our lives. And we want to say that in our community, that Jesus Christ, who Caleb mentioned, is the truth. Jesus Christ, that truth, is so important for us to be able to share in this place at this time in history. It's a privilege to be able to share in that with you. I wanted to shout out, uh, give a shout out to uh, the people who are involved in the small groups, and in particular, those who are leading small groups, because I know from my experience in leading small groups that there's always time that's involved in preparing and and doing the kinds of things so that a small group can have a meaningful dialogue. And and this morning, um, uh, Mike and I were talking for just a little bit about the importance of small groups and that the group he's involved in is one that's digging in to some of the things that we find in Thessalonians and and tying that together with faith and life. And as we do that in small groups and in uh, different kinds of ways in our personal Bible study, uh, in our devotional reading, in the Bible through the year reading that we're doing, God blesses us. And it's so important for us to be open to the things that he provides for us in this life. One of those understandings is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That comes from John chapter 14, and what we'll do is spend a little bit of time in that this morning. So let's join together in a word of prayer as we begin our time together. Lord Jesus, today today we focus on who you are. Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the life. And your words spoken to the disciples help us to get an insight into who you are and what your promise is and the assurance that you give to all who believe in you. That's us. Lord, we pray that you bless us as we think through how you would have us be truth tellers in this life. Lord, bless us to be those who carry that message of hope that we have in you. And bless us to be those who proclaim in the way that we live that you are our risen Savior, ascended into heaven. Your promise of eternal life is ours. Guide us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so... Talking about truth and honesty and honest Abe and different things that we know of truth in this life, we think about the joy that there is in being able to celebrate truth and truth-filledness. But honestly, the truth spoken in love is something that oftentimes challenges people. That's reality. The truth sometimes, sometimes hurts a little bit because it gets under our skin. Maybe we're not quite living in the way that God calls us to live. And so the truth is important for us to be able to have and to be able to know, to be able to do. We have that wonderful model in Scripture. Jesus is the truth. So as we think through what it means to know Jesus as the truth, there's a lot of people who have commented on what it means to know truth. And there's people that give their opinions about things all the time. Benjamin Franklin talked about this. He talked about half a truth is often a great lie. 
Now think about that. Half-truth is often a great lie. If you're not telling the whole truth, boy, that might not express truth well. And then we think about different people from our past, and, and Andy Rooney is one of those guys. How many of you remember Andy Rooney? He was kind of a commentator. I think it was 60 Minutes that he was on for a while, and he would always come on and give some kind of a perspective. And, and this is what he said, people will generally accept facts as truth only if the facts agree with what they already believe. So that would mean that if someone is a truth teller in their life and they don't believe it, then maybe they wouldn't accept it as truth. How true is that? And then we have this question from Pontius Pilate. Remember when Jesus is standing before Pilate? He's been uh, in his presence and there's, there's this robe that's put on him and he's been spat upon and all sorts of things have happened to him. And Pilate is commenting and talking about how Jesus is a king. And Jesus answers him and says, actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to what? The truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. That's a word for us that's significant today because there's lots and lots and lots of challenges that are out there even as there was when Jesus was testifying about himself before Pilate. And you know what Pilate's question is then? What is truth? What he didn't know? What he wasn't able to see was that truth And the author of truth was standing right beside him. The author of truth, the author of those things that are absolute. We talk about, is there any absolute truth anymore? And the reality is, yes, there is for Christians. And that is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ is is who we base our hope in, and not just hope. When the Bible talks about hope, it really is talking about more than just a wish. It's talking about the assurance that we have that Jesus Christ is Savior. And that the assurance we have right now today for you as believers, no matter what happens in your life, no matter What you do or have done, your sins as a believer in Jesus are forgiven and the assurance that you have in confessing Jesus Christ is this, and this is truth. You'll be with the Lord eternally. That's powerful. That's so significant. We want something that we can count on. The truth that Jesus expresses is simply that. Okay, sermon's done. (laughs) No, not exactly. So, I've been reading in Scripture, and as a matter of fact, the the office staff have been uh, reading through the Bible in a year and following uh, this plan that we have, and Tara Lee Cobble uh, does some commenting on that Uh, Bible reading each day that we do. And I'm in Deuteronomy right now. And and so it's all of these laws and all of these rules that God's giving for people to live by. And you think, how can I do all of that? How can I follow after God's heart? And when we think that, when we say that, we do desire to be those who follow in the way that God directs us to live if we want a model of what that means, we need to only look to Jesus. In the definition that he gives of himself, the way, the truth, and the life, we have that model of what it means to live the heart of God because that's what he did. He lived the heart of God. Here's a good question for you. Who are the truth tellers 
in your life? Who are those people that you count on to be truthful for you? Lots of us would suggest that the first truth tellers that we knew would have been our parents. And we also know that our parents, as great of parents as they may have been, were not always absolutely 100% truthful. I remember my mom. Mom, mom was a saint. I'm, I, seriously. She raised four boys who got into trouble all the time. And <laughs> just to give you a little story about my brothers and, and me, we decided to run away one time. So we ran away and we were living in the uh, parsonage of the school that dad was teaching in. It was a rural school down in Haven, Kansas. And <laughs> in between the school and the church was a cemetery. So we made it up to the edge of the cemetery before Mrs. Karstensen, who was the pastor's wife, came out and said, hey boys, I've got some cookies for you. Would you like to come in? She was a truth teller. And she told mom that we were running away. Mom, a few years later, told the truth, but kind of filtered because she was driving a 1947 Plymouth at the time, and it was in the 1960s that she was driving this car. And I asked mom, I said, mom, how, how come we can't get a different car that works all the time? And she said, well, you know, Mark, the car starts most of the time. The car runs and does what we need for it to do right now. So we're pretty satisfied with the car. That was honest, kind of. Because really what she was saying was, Mark, we really can't afford to get a different car right now. And the reality of that was that they were both, mom and dad were both teaching school and they were, they were both trying to make ends meet with these four hungry boys that had mouths that needed to be filled. And, and so the reality was she knew what we could take. She knew what we needed to hear. That was truth. And she shared that with us. So Jesus shares with the disciples this understanding of truth. And the way that that ties in is this. This is three years into the time when Jesus has been with the disciples. When this passage is spoken, it's spoken on the night before he would die. Okay, when they were celebrating the Passover meal that Jesus led them in on the night before he died, that's when this quotation in scripture is recorded by John. I am the way and the truth and the life. It's through those three years that Jesus was absolutely the truth, but he was showing them, the disciples, what it meant to know the way and to know the truth and to know the life. And so this morning, what I'd like for us to do is talk about Jesus, truth teller. And the way to do that, the way we want to kind of get into that is to be able to understand this passage from John chapter 14. And so what I'm going to do is ask that if you would, read with me, and that way it'll be fresh in our minds. So let's read together. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know the way where you are going, 
How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So what's Jesus after? What's the point? He's helping the disciples to understand that he is that one who is the reflection and literally is God in front of them, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one who is that truth teller in their lives, the one who they can trust, the one whose words are even the words of Yahweh, of God. The I am statements of Jesus reflect on the I am statements of Yahweh. I am the way and the truth and the life. And we think back to when Moses led the people out of Egypt and what did God tell them to tell Moses to tell Pharaoh and the people of Israel? I am, tell them, I am sent you. The name for Jesus, or at least the name for Jesus in the New Testament, I am, as he describes himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, is the same name that he shares with Yahweh in the Old Testament, I am. As we think that through, we hear about how Thomas is being this very human person. I mean, who wouldn't ask him, Jesus, I just, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand how this can happen. Lord, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And what does Jesus say? He answers his question in a way that is so helpful for Thomas. He just says, Thomas, get this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's an encouragement to Thomas. But then Jesus follows up on that encouragement, on that understanding of who he is and delivering that to Thomas. And he says, hey, Thomas, get this. If you had known me over the course of these last three years, Thomas, if you'd known me, if you would have paid a little more attention, perhaps, Thomas, you would have known my father also. And then he shares this statement, which gives perspective when he says, from now on, you know him. And he's talking about the father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So promise, Jesus' promise in the face of the things that were about to happen that night, right? That night, we know that the disciples were going to leave Jesus. None of them were going to be following him. None of them were going to be defending him all the way against those who were going to arrest him. So, in the previous chapter, from John chapter 14, we have Jesus washing the disciples' feet. So when the feet of travelers were washed, it was a hospitality that would be provided by a homeowner. And so especially as people were going to Jerusalem, the homeowners would be ready to have a servant, usually the lowliest servant in the household, 
Be prepared to wash the feet of travelers who would be staying in those upper rooms, those rooms above the house that were ready for people who would be coming at that time. And so here we have Jesus who is the way and the truth and the life. He's washing the disciples' feet. So what do you make of that? And he asks them, he says, do you understand what I've done for you? And as he asks them that, he helps them to see what it means to love and to serve. And he talks further, Jesus does, about what that means. And then just after he washes the feet of the disciples, one of the disciples gets up and is ready to leave after Jesus addresses him and says, what you are going to do, do quickly. Judas left to betray Jesus. After Jesus displays his incredible love for these disciples, lowers himself in a position on his knees to serve them, Judas leaves. And Jesus addresses the disciples, and he says this is so significant. A new command I give to you, love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So as Jesus has built his credibility with the disciples over the last three years, what he does is he then shares with them what the goal is. Even as God has loved us so much that he would send his very son into the world to die to save us from our sins, Jesus commands the disciples to love one another. Knowing full well later that evening that their love would be challenged and they would all run away. A little bit later, he says, where I'm going, you can't come. And then we have Peter, bold Peter. And he says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where, you're go- where I'm going, you can't come now, but you will follow afterwards. And Peter says to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. Indeed. You will lay your down your lay down your life for me. But then he says, Peter, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. I want you to catch this. Because the passage that we're focusing on, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life comes just after that in chapter 14. And as we walked through and read that passage, Jesus talks about going to prepare a place for the disciples in his father's house to build on a room, as, as was the custom, to be able to build on a room for that house so that they could be together. That's normally what a bridegroom would do for his bride in his father's house. Here's the deal. Jesus knew all along that the disciples were not going to be defending him later that evening. And he still says, I'm going to put a room on my father's house for you where he lives. He knew full well Peter was going to deny him. He knew full 
full well all those disciples would desert him. He knew full well that Judas was going to betray him. And what does he do? He says, I'm going to make a place for you. That's so significant for us. I absolutely believe that Peter meant every word that he said, that he would die for Jesus. But I also know that not unlike me, when Peter was challenged with a situation where he was out of control, when he was challenged by a situation where he had to make a choice, when he was challenged in a situation where his faith was put to the test, Peter runs away too. Jesus knew that. But he still knew, and he still wanted them to know that he was going to prepare a place for them because they would be with him eternally. This is what Luke chapter 22 says, and it talks about this denial of Peter. A little later, someone else saw him, Peter, and said, you're also one of them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. I don't know. I don't know the guy. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, guess what happened? The rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Luke's the only one who records that. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. Truth teller? Yeah, sometimes the truth hurts. How many times in our lives has the truth hurt? How many times in our lives has Jesus spoken to us the truth about how it is that God desires us to live? And how many times have we as people not lived according to the way that Jesus has called us to live? All of us, all of us, I think, can understand that. I think we can all understand that as Jesus proclaims, I go to prepare a place for you, that that's exactly what he's doing, even in the face of our sinfulness. That's incredible. That's remarkable. The truth in our life is that Jesus is that. Even though he knows that Peter's going to deny him, even though he knows the others are going to run away, he still says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you in my father's house. Jesus knows your sin. There's nothing you can hide from him. Jesus knows my sin. Jesus knew Peter's sin. He knew Judas' sin. He knew all the disciples' sins. He knows you intimately. He knows you better than you know yourselves. He knows your deepest thoughts. He gets it. When not unlike the disciples, we compromise on following after God's heart. He knows the sins that you've committed that you would not share with your closest confidant because you're afraid that if they heard that, they might think less of you. He knows of those perverted practices that 
you've done, whatever that might mean to you, perverted in that they aren't following after the heart of God. They're perverted. They're away from God's heart for the sake of our own comfort or convenience. He knows your shortcomings. He knows what it means to have a relationship that's been cheated on. Because that's what the disciples did. That's what Judas did. He knows your failings when it comes to raising kids. He knows mine. He knows you seek to satisfy your own agenda. He knows of your weaknesses when it comes to any one of the addictions that you may be battling. He knows your faults when you claim, it wasn't my fault. How many of us have said that? How many of us stand convicted? He knows when your worldview is mostly the view that comes from your own lenses, focusing inside of yourself and on your needs. Boy, am I guilty of that. And so he calls on the disciples to be truth tellers in the world. Truth tellers about who he is. Truth tellers of who it is that is the way and the truth and the life. He calls on them to speak the truth in love as Paul encouraged the Ephesians. He calls on them to be about loving others and rejoicing in the truth calls on us even in the midst of our own sins to be those who follow after his heart let's pray oh Lord you're the speaker of truth in our lives we praise you that you've paid the price for our forgiveness by giving your life in atonement for ours. We come before you knowing that we're sinful in our thoughts and in our words and in our deeds and confess that we've sinned against you. Our sins are great. Your love is greater. You went to the cross where nails didn't hold you there, but your determination to pay the price for our sins is what held you. You've won for us the victory over death and Satan and blessed us to receive the most precious gift that we will ever know, that of eternal life. For this, Lord, we praise you and we thank you. Bless us. Bless us to be truth tellers. Bless us to be those who reflect your love in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's not the end. His promise to you, his promise is that you are forgiven. His promise is that your sins were paid for by the one who loved you so much he gave up his life for you. His promise, his promise is absolute and certain. And we can live with that every single day, even in the midst of the challenges we face. He is truth in our lives. He speaks truth into our hearts so that we, in some way, can be those truth tellers in our world. May God bless you in that pursuit. Amen.